All right, good day. Should learn some Chinese, but I don't know anything yet. <laughs> My first time here, so it's quite exciting. Uh, just to make sure, uh, I, I'm going to try to speak slower, just so because I, I, you know, I suspect there's a lot of non-native speakers. Uh, but I do have a lot of material, uh, and I do have a tendency, my normal uh, tendency of presenting is actually rapid fire. So, don't hesitate to slow me down, say, to do this, <laughs> that's right, stop that. <laughs> um, I'm assuming I'm being translated, but I don't see anybody with, oh, there's one, one headset, okay, so, there might be a delay there. Um, this talk. Well, first of all, uh, I'm Ken. I guess I should click this. There. Are we on? There. All right. Got to hit the right button again. I'm Ken. I am one of the distributed application engineers at Mesosphere. Uh, I've been with Mesosphere now for two, over two years. Uh, I'm an employee 22. <laughs> so I, I was, um, prior to coming to Mesosphere, I was heading up research and development at a company called Satis, which was part of CenturyLink. In the US, that is the third largest ISP. Uh, and they asked my team to figure out where's the cloud going to be in two to five years, which is funny because now it's two years later, right? <laughs> uh, and humans are predictably terrible at predicting the future, and it's worse when you start throwing in technology. Uh, but the three things that uh, the team that I was on determined would be game changers. Uh, one was Docker, and at the time it was point three, version point three, so uh, it was pretty early on. Uh, the other was uh, CoreOS, uh, and now there's more, uh, that, that was the one that's kind of a wild card. I, I'm not sure, um, they still have a pretty neat thing, and Rancher is here. Uh, there's a number of things that might work out in that space. But the other one was Mesos, Apache Mesos. So uh, that's me, um, and I work on a lot of different, I'm an Apache committer, uh, I'm an uh, Apache contributor to Mesos, I'm not a, a, a committer on that project yet. And I mainly work in the space of Java, but I say that the current project that I moved to six months ago was in Scala, and what I've been doing for the last three months pretty much is Python, which is my first Python project, it's been interesting. <laughs> so don't laugh at my code. Oh. So I meant to say this, um, this is going to be a technically deep talk, so hopefully you're okay with that. Uh, there are some, some challenges, I only have an hour, and there's a bunch of stuff that you'll need to know in order for the shakedown to make sense. So I've got a good 20 minutes or so of kind of intro, which is, not, which is kind of a deep dive into Mesos and how Mesos works a little bit. Um, who in here is using Mesos? You're actually using it. Okay, great. Who in here is using DC West? Okay, a smaller or yeah, that was a half mess. <laughs> I was like, I was thinking about it. Okay, I'm going to talk about uh, Shakedown. It is a testing tool. It's a testing framework for DC West. But the reality is, almost everything I'm going to show you can be completely used on Mesos. All right. There are some things. I'll, I'll throw in the caveats because there's such a strong number of people who use Mesos without DC West. Um, I, I'll throw in some, uh, some nuggets out there as to what might not apply. There are some pretty strong differences. I'll also show you some of the infrastructure. Now, I have one challenge. It's a pretty significant one. Uh, I had fully intended to be up here with my laptop <laughs> and actually doing demos live and looking at stuff. Uh, I am going to go through slides right now, these slides. Uh, I am then, towards the end, going to go back there and probably demo stuff. I'll be on mic, and I'm hoping that you're staring at the screen. You don't need to see me, right? Uh, but I actually want to show off some stuff, like actually do it. Uh, I want you to have that exposure. If I had one hope or goal out of this, is, uh, is that you're actually taking a look at Shakedown and making some improvements, maybe sending some pull requests, uh, and, and helping to improve things. If you want, you can also send in some pull requests for your frameworks or links to your code. And I'd be happy to take a look at it uh, from, a, from a testing perspective if you'd like, all right? So the, the core of it, I've been working on Mesos for a long time and, and schedulers for a long time. Prior to being on the Marathon team, which is what I'm currently on, I was working on the data agility team, which means Cassandra, HD, HDFS was my main thing for about six months. Uh, Cassandra, HDFS, Spark, uh, there's a bunch of them. Um, I don't know, oh, Kafka. I don't know if they're important, right? 
What is important is that if you take all of those frameworks, all of them, they have a certain nature and how they work with Mesos or with DCUS, and we're going to talk a lot about that. All right. So I'll get going. Um, so Shakedown, what is it? So Shakedown itself is a project which is, uh, you can see the quote up here, it, it, it actually comes with some kind of background to it, right? It's, it's the thing we used to do to, to ships and airplanes. We used to put it through a test before putting on its maiden voyage, right? Now, uh, even though I'm from the US, I've traveled and speak on different subjects and technology all over the world. It's the first time in, in Asia at all, being in China for sure. And it is amazing here, by the way. I want to say that, that uh, Beijing's airport, I've never seen a bigger airport. I've been all over the world and there's a bigger airport. It's amazing. So that said, what it reminded me of, I was just in May, I was in Stockholm, Sweden, and I don't know if you've ever heard the story of the ship Vasa, but the, the Vasa ship was created by the, the, the king of Sweden years and years ago, uh, and he was in battle, and he wanted to sh show off. He wanted to prove he was bigger and badder than the other kings he was fighting, and they created this ship. This ship, <laughs> on its maiden voyage, about 20 minutes into it, sank to the bottom of the sea. And now they've re recovered it and it's in the museum in Stockholm if you ever want to go there. It's a fascinating story. But out of all of that, there were two things that were huge drivers into this ship being uh, a failure. Uh, one, there's a number, there's like, there's a huge number of them. But the two that stand out relative to our talk is that they had a high rate of change, a number of changes in the number of uh, cannons they wanted to put on board, the number of uh, just a bunch of stuff. Uh, but the other thing was testing, testing. So we're going to focus a little bit on testing. Uh, here's our agenda for the session. I've never done this before, so we have an hour. I have no idea whether I'm going to go over or I'm going to go under. We'll see, right? Uh, but feel free to uh, ask questions. So testing, the testing in general. But, but now I'm, I'm making a couple assumptions, and these are big. One is that you're developers. Like this is a developer talk, right? So when we get into testing, what do we mean? Well, typically there are three different types of tests that we're thinking about. Unit test, integration test, and system integration test. Now that last one may be kind of an odd one to you, but that's the thing we're gonna talk about, and it's significant. So when we look at unit tests, what we're talking about is you're writing code, you're dealing with a unit of code, so in Java, you're writing it in Java, usually. You're probably using JUnit. Um, if you're in Scala, you're using Scala tests, right? There's a number of options here. Uh, they're usually fast running. They're usually not connecting to any external systems. There's a number of characteristics, and we expect this to run every time someone's gonna push code. You're gonna run this prior to, or you're gonna push it, and it's gonna run on the CI environment, the continuous integration environment, right? So that's the characteristic of a unit test. Now, what can be confusing is this uh, integration test. Integration test still, <coughs> It's in the code, it's still in Java, it's in the language of the project almost always. The difference is, is it's not just a small unit, it's a collaboration of classes or a collaboration of objects. But often what we're wanting to do in an integration test is integrate with something else, right? You may have a fake database. You might do an in-memory database. You're not using a real database, you're using something that mocks it in some way. You're doing mock tests, right? These tests can be slower. And oftentimes, the slowness of these tests is due to data. You, you have to establish some data, you do some changes, you run your assertion, and then you want to back that data back out and start over again, essentially, right? So it, it almost always has to do with data. Or it could be connectivity, the latency associated with certain things. Now, this next component of system integration tests is where we're going to focus on, but it's really strongly different. In this environment, we are actually putting, so let's be very specific, we are putting a Mesos framework into a Mesos cluster and we're testing it. How does it act? What is, what's going on with it? How does it respond to failure? Those are the kind of things that we're going to be looking at. And probably a better way of looking at uh, the, the three comparisons here is to look at this spreadsheet or the, 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 this table. And the biggest one is the time. You know, we expect things in unit tests, this is probably too high, it should be fast, it should be sub-second, right? But this should be fast. This is slower, can be, it varies, it's usually due to mocking and data. And this is like really, really slow. And in fact, sometimes we don't really control a lot of it. We don't control any of this. I'm running tests all the time on Amazon, 
And there are things that you normally get done in seconds, and they could take tens or thirty seconds sometimes. It's so widely varies. So you have to be prepared for that. Right? That's a strong, strong difference. You don't have controls like you have in an integrated or a unit test environment. Some big ones is that you, you have network access, right? Whoops, wrong direction. We have network access, uh, we're using external systems and it requires a whole cluster. We need the whole cluster set up. So those are pretty significant differences. These buttons are backwards for me, by the way. <laughs> okay, some things I wanna re-emphasize. When we're on a cluster, there are, it's a real world cluster. Everything in Mesos is asynchronous. That seems to be foreign to people who are very new to Mesos, but everything's asynchronous. When you register and you get a response back, like literally when I make a socket connection and the return of the socket, the, the response means nothing. All, I, I hope it got there. There's some level of guaranteed delivery that TCP provides me. There's some level of guaranteed messaging we get with Mesos, unless you're using framework messages, which isn't guaranteed. It's asynchronous. The only way that I know that a registration occurs is a callback occurs. Again, it's asynchronous. All, everything in Mesos is asynchronous. It's really hard. It's a really, that's the, that's the number one thing that you have to be aware of and concerned about. So uh, you, you need to be in that world. You need to be in that thought, uh, that mind thought. Um, okay, so let's talk about DCOS. And what I really mean is Mesos. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll provide some differences here in a second. So the first is, if you're not familiar, is that to create a Mesos environment, we have some Mesos masters, uh, and here we have three. At a minimum, in dev, when I'm doing shakedown, I have one, because I don't care. Unless I do, like sometimes I'm literally testing the, what, what, what's gonna happen if a Mesos leadership change occurs on my framework. And that's the thing I'm testing. In that case, I need three, probably. Right? The magic number in production is five, but it varies, right? Uh, one, development. Three is the minimum HA, high availability cluster. Five is the magic one for the most number of nines, right? So hopefully everybody's aware of that. Anything I'm saying in here, I'm gonna be at the booth afterward, you can come dig into more details. But that's what we recommend. Beyond that, there's a quorum of zookeepers that manage that whole mess. So I need that. Now, if we're doing shakedown, we're testing the whole cluster. You need everything. So typically, I have a zookeeper, I have a, a master, I have a set of agents. We've changed the name of slaves to agents. But it can, and it can be any number of them. Now, there's a couple of reasons why I may need a varying size cluster. If I'm testing HDFS, it requires five uh, agents. I have to have five. I need three for three uh, journal nodes, and I need two data nodes, so I need five. Um, so you have to be in the mindset of what is your application or your framework doing in order to know what size cluster you need, what, how many slaves you need. Uh, for the test that we're going to do in here, I've got a two-node cluster. Uh, when we're talking about DCUFs, you also may be testing a public node versus a private node. And so those are the kind of things that you might be interested in. And then we have our framework or our scheduler itself. Uh, again, I'm making an assumption people know what that is. I'll start diving into some of its behavior here in a few minutes. Um, okay, so that's the core of Mesos. Beyond that, we can talk DCOS, and this is the infrastructure that we have when we install a DCOS cluster. And the DCOS cluster, we have some things that are super important to realize that are outside of the Mesos world. The first is that we have this, this admin bubble here. We call it the admin router. There is um, essentially an Nginx process that is monitoring things and handles all incoming requests. For any scheduler that gets registered appropriately in DCOS, it will not only be a scheduler on Mesos, it'll also be registered with a service endpoint in the admin router. And that becomes the entry point for one, RESTful APIs, and two, it's the entry point for our CLI, for our command line. So that becomes super important to us. It's the one thing that we are gonna be testing against in here as I start to show off some code in a few minutes. Okay? So the admin routers becomes very, very important. Also, if you're not familiar with DCOS as a whole, um, you can go to this master, and, and, and if you just went to it with nothing else in the URL, you'll go to, essentially, DCOS. You'll get the DCOS UI. But you could put slant mesos, and you'd see mesos. You could put slant marathon, and you'd see the root marathon. And you could put slant uh, 
exhibitor, and you would see the exhibitor access into the zookeeper. So there's a number of things that aren't often advertised that, might, that are going to be useful to know in here when you're dealing as a framework author, and you need to understand what's going on inside the cluster, especially that's, that's necessary when we're doing shakedown type tests. All right, so we have this master, and it has an admin router. You can see that we have a web interface to that. There's also a RESTful in interface into that. There's a CLI interface into that. That master then will communicate with two types of nodes. The first is essentially here labeled a worker node, and we, uh, we have one in the public and we have one in the private space. This is where the lion's share of your cluster size will be. This will probably be one node. It could be more. It varies on what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, private means private though. Uh, so the network connectivity for the master is the only thing that's talking to these nodes, and these nodes can talk to each other, and it can probably talk to the public, but no public traffic will come to the private nodes. That is the design intent of that. Okay, so let's talk about how Mesos and DCOS works. And mainly at this point we're talking Mesos. All right? So the first is, uh, again, if you are creating a framework for Mesos, there are two components to a framework. One is there is the scheduler, and two, there is an executor. Almost all the stuff that we're going to talk about in here is going to be scheduler oriented. Um, we are probably a little bit weak in the executor uh, in testing infrastructure at this point. So if you see some things that you'd like to add, please tell me. I'd love to get the, 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 the to-do list to work on over the next month. Uh, the scheduler. The scheduler's job is to register with the master. It will uh, usually find it through a zookeeper lookup. Uh, it doesn't matter. You can literally tell it where the master is and it would find it. It would then do a registration. Thing to note, more, uh, very important, you can see here that um, the scheduler, it's going to send a call to the master. It's asynchronous. The scheduler, your scheduler, this is your work, right? Like, I'm going to give you an example of Marathon. Or, or Kronos or Metronome. I'll, I'll have a number of examples in here we'll look at. But the idea is that you have a scheduler. Right? So if you have a scheduler, the one thing to know is when you register with the master, you should have a timeout. And that timeout is, wait a minute, I registered with the master, and I haven't heard back, and it hasn't told me I'm registered yet, so what's going on? Right? Uh, it's all asynchronous. You don't know. Eventually, the master will call back and say, you're registered. It's all asynchronous. So those are the kinds of things that you could test. <clears throat> In this example, we're actually looking at an offer that's coming through. So essentially, all these agents will be talking with the master. The master will have uh, essentially a, a list of resources that are available across the cluster. And it will per periodically <clears throat> it will send offer requests to the scheduler. It will say, hey, there's an offer available. Uh, so that's the way this works, right? It, it's it's very if you're very if you're very new to Mesos, this is quite different than say Yarn or some of the other schedulers out there. It's not top driven. It's not the scheduler says I want this. It's the other way around. It's Mesos the master comes through and says, Hey, I've got agents uh, that have offers available of this size. Do you want to use them? That's the way it works. Then you can either hoard them these offers, uh, which is not something I would encourage. <laughs> uh, you could decline them. Or you can accept them. Those are the three things that you can do with those offers. Now there are schedulers for which hoarding is a useful concept where you need so much of the cluster to be able to do some kind of work. They are rare. Um, but that would be something interesting to test. right? Those are the kinds of things that you're looking to test. Like if I send an offer to the scheduler and the offer is too small, it shouldn't give me a decline. And those are the kinds of things I might be testing. Uh, and then we get to the rest of this with the scheduler, but it becomes less interesting. Let's walk through what that looks like. Again, all I'm trying to emphasize here is the asynchronous nature of how Mesos works. So first we have a Mesos master that will register with a zookeeper, uh, probably a quorum of zookeepers. Notice a couple of things. Um, agents come on and they register. Now notice that first of all, here we have a, an agent that came in, did a zookeeper lookup, and then did a register, that is a one-way call. It's asynchronous. So the next thing that happens is the master will come through and say, yeah, you're registered. Cool. That's all asynchronous, right? Um, if you don't get that call back, then, then, it's, then the slave is not active. Uh, Marathon, I'm going to look at a lot in here, mainly because I've been working the last two to three months on uh, shakedown tests 
and since that's our topic, it seems easy to show what I've been currently working on as examples. Uh, but Marathon will come in here and do a lookup right here. It will do a register. Notice the same thing occurs. Uh, it will, the master will come through, yeah, you're registered. This is the same kind of activity I would expect with your framework. When you create a framework, you're going to register, you're going to get a callback that says you are registered. And then a bunch of offers come in. Now you have to decide your logic as to what you do with that. Marathon declines all offers coming in. It just keeps declining them. Why? Because nobody's ever told Marathon what to do yet. <laughs> it doesn't have anything to do. All it does is what a user tells it to do. So along comes a client and it makes a, a request for an application to run. Now it has an objective, and that objective is to land this thing on an agent that has a set of resources defined by the job. Right? So we can say that's the def definition of the job, that it needs two cores, that it needs four gigs of uh, memory, or four, yeah, four gigs of memory. Uh, when the next offer comes in, we will ask the master to launch that. Notice who's talking to who at this point. This is super important because this is literally what's happening. Uh, it will be assigned a certain agent that matches that. It will be told to launch. In that process, it will launch an executor. The executor, as it might, uh, all frameworks have a scheduler and an executor. If you don't have a defined executor, the default executor will be used. So there is a Mesos executor that will be the default. It's going to launch some activity. Uh, it will be asked to launch that. It will launch a task. Notice a couple of things that might be useful. Um, Mesos is interesting in that uh, this is loosely defined. Um, we have this thing called a task. That's this thing. And the reason why it's not called a process is because the task could be a thread or it could be a process. So you, your framework is to decide what that is. Right. By default, it's, in this particular case, it's going to be a process. We're going to launch that process. Also important to note that this thing, that there is a slave, hmm, I want to be very specific about things. There is a node, let's say that node is defined here, right? There is a node. The node has an agent process running on it. It has an agent process. So the kinds of things that could be on the agent node is an agent process that could die or bounce. Uh, it could have an executor that dies. It could have a process that dies. Those are all things that are important to us as we start to test these things out. Right? So as a quick example, if uh, there's some status updates that come uh, filtering back as well. Now, the, the thing that's really interesting about a status update, there are two types of messaging when you're dealing with a framework or a service inside of DCOS or Mesos. There are two types of messages that we have. One type of message is this, it's a status. And the status messages are guaranteed delivery. So if there's any kind of network failure that happens along the way, as soon as the master, if it died and then came back, it would eventually receive the status update. It's guaranteed to happen. There's another kind of message that we have, which is a framework message. Framework messages are not guaranteed. Now, they're using TCP, so TCP is guaranteed delivery from point to point from a networking standpoint, and that's true. But what we can't say is that if the, track, if the, if the packet went across, and it made it to the master, and at that point the master died, I can't say that the master actually acted on the message that came through, which is very strongly different than uh, with, a, with, a, met with a, a status update. Because a status update, if it wasn't acknowledged at an application layer, not at a TCP layer, if the application didn't acknowledge, it will be resent until it is acknowledged. All right? Those are very important to understand when you're dealing with Mesos. Okay. So, and eventually this goes back all the way to the framework, and the framework can then decide what it's going to do. In the case of Marathon, it logs these things. It, it manages these, this information inside of Zookeeper. At the, at currently, that's what it does. I think we're going to move away from that, but that's what it does today. All right, so when we have a task failure, uh, we have something that failed here. Uh, we have some status update that happens. It goes back to Marathon. So this is the thing to expect. There is a relationship between the, with the, the agent process and the executors that it has. It's talking to them, and all of a sudden it can't talk to it anymore. 
or the, the executor can't talk to the process anymore. Any one of those things will cause a rippling effect to have a status update go to the master and then to the framework that owns that task and acknowledge the fact that that doesn't exist any longer, right? that it was killed in some way or lost. A loss is a little bit different, but in this case, it's a kill. Uh, what Marathon is designed to do, now this will be up to you, uh, your framework author, <laughs> as to what you will do here, but it seems logical that you're going to relaunch that thing. Right? So in this particular case, we say relaunch the thing. Uh, if you had, there's lots of reasons it might still land on the same node that it's on. It would then relaunch that whole process, and then you'd get status updates coming back, all the way back until you, you know it's running again. And that is exactly how Marathon works. All right, any questions about that? Because that, that's important to moving on to the testing. I'm going to dive into testing now. You guys are quiet, all right. I'm going to, oh, <laughs> you ruined my joke. I was going to say, I was, I'm not following. Uh, I'm not following still. Um, we might have to take it offline. I don't want to get too much in the weeds. And that seems specific to the, the what I'm hoping to do is cover uh, how the framework and the messaging works, because we're about to test that. Uh, that might dive a little bit deeper into a specific subject, which I'd be happy to cover, by the way. Um, so, um, is that good? I will, I'm going to corner you after we get done this talk, and I'm going to answer your question. Right? But I don't quite understand it yet. So, All right, so let's talk about Shakedown. Uh, we, we understand testing. We understand that system integration testing. We understand how DCUS or Mesos works. We're going to put it all together. So the first thing is, we can go out to the project side. Uh, important things to know about Shakedown. One, it's Python. Right? So you're going to be writing stuff in Python. If you're using Shakedown, you're using Python. Um, two, it's using Python 3.4. So the default for most Linux distros is 2.7 still, which is way old, but that's the truth. <laughs> um, we're using 3.4. There's a lot of projects within the Mesosphere world that uh, is moving to 3.5. So I don't know if that will change here or not. I've gotten used to using, if this is due to you, I've gotten really used to using Pi ENV, which is a, similar to an RB, like a Ruby ENV, which allows you to manage multiple versions of Python, which has become necessary in my life lately. <laughs> so, um, so be aware of that. It's Python. You're going to install it simply by this. Now, if you have a, a cluster already be, uh, created, if you're in your own private data center, you, of course, are going to need to have access to Pi Pi. Uh, the ability to install Python libraries. So that will be a minimum. We're going to do a pi, uh, I'm sorry, a pip install of DCOS Shakedown. Now if you're a developer, it's a little bit different potentially, at least it is for me. If I do a git clone of the Shakedown project, which by the way is an open source project on the DCOS um, namespace. Uh, let's see here, yeah. Uh, I, I'll do a pip install of dot pip install dash e dot, and then I'm installing whatever the current latest and greatest is. So those are the two types of things that I might do. Uh, some things to know when you're getting started. The first is that I need to, you're on your own to create the cluster. Shakedown doesn't do anything with cluster creation. Now, what Shakedown can provide is as soon as you have a cluster, uh, it can provide like package installs of things. You can do that through Python. Sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. Sometimes I do the installation external to running the, pi, uh, the shakedown. So I, I don't know if I have a reason why I did one versus the other, but the framework of the, the toolkit provides the ability to do things with the universe. And uh, again, I, probably one of the things I left out of DCUS conversation is there, the whole goal of DCUS is, is a data center operating system. So it sounds a little bit weird that you have an operating system for the whole data center, right? But what does that mean? What do we mean when we say operating system? Well, when we say operating system, it should have a file system. It should have a packaging management tool, like an app get install or a yum install. It should have, we go through the list of things we expect an operating system to have. Well, with DCOS, we expect to have that. Um, it's a little bit different in that you can't say it's always X. Like with a file system, it could be S3. 
or it could be cluster, or it could be HDFS. Those are all valid ways of storing things in a file format type uh, mechanism. Um, but with packaging, we call it the universe. So again, another open source component where we can, as brew, if you're used to a Mac, if you're used to using brew, um, a homebrew, that is, uh, with a brew install, that's the same, it's a similar packaging mechanism. I'll show you in a second if that's one to you. So a DCOS cluster, you've got to create one. The second is, you've got to configure Shakedown. So this is an install of Shakedown if you don't already have it. Uh, there's some configuration options I'm going to show you in a second. And then you just need to run it. And at that point, you just run it. And I'm going to show you some examples of that as well. Hopefully, we'll have time to actually show demos. Uh, this is just doing a shakedown dash dash help when you first get it. These are all the options that you have. Some of them are really quite new. Is that me? Could be me. It's kind of a neat effect, though. Sorry. It was pretty cool. Oh, you turned me off, didn't you? All right. Uh, some of these are really quite new. Uh, Let's see here. Uh, you can see we can pass the SSH key. We can uh, have standard out. I tend to like standard out. Some newer stuff, we started adding in some authorization type things uh, recently. So those are, are relatively new to me, but uh, don't mind looking at them if you want. Uh, that is just doing help. How do you run this thing? Well, typically what you do is something like this. Now, I've added in some Unix style type things just because they're there, right? Uh, you'd say shakedown. It used to be, not that long ago, in fact, this just changed within the month. It used to be you had to provide this. This is re required flag that always had to be passed. Was dash dash DCOS URL. Now it turns out that as a developer, I always have a DCOS URL already pre-configured with what I'm working on. So I'm just saying, give me whatever is already configured. Uh, within the last month, we're like, you know what, just go find it. If, if it's there, just find it, right? Now, the, the thing that's strongly different is if I'm running on my local box, I always have a DCOS cluster installed or ready to go, almost always. But if I'm running in a CI, a continuous integration environment, I may not. So you, you don't have to have one configured. If you don't have one configured in your CI environment, you may pass this in. All right, uh, what else? You can see uh, SSH key. Uh, you don't always need that. You need it whenever you're do running commands on a node or if you're transferring files. There are, uh, and whenever you're doing network partitioning, we have, we have some, uh, some functions that provide network partitioning. When you do that, it's sending over a file and executing a command. It's actually changing the firewall rules. So you would need an SSH key in order to do that. I say that because I have a cluster creation tool that I'm happy to show you, but it's internal to Mesosphere, and we haven't provided it to people. It's for our own purposes. It auto-provisions on Amazon with keys that all of our developers have for development cluster, which makes sense. When we're running stuff on GCE or on Azure, which we do, um, I don't have those advantages, and we're still trying to figure out how we want to manage that. We're also working with clients that are working in a private data center for which they have no access to things. Okay, well. You would need to provision nodes that support SSH if you are wanting to use this capability. Outside of that, the big thing here is a bunch of extra flags that I'll show in a second, but this right here. Test, this last line here, test system, test network part.py. That is the test suite that I'm looking to run with that line of execution. So that's an example of what I would be running in a CI environment to do some network partitioning of whatever it is that I'm running. In this case, it's going to be Marathon. Now, we've kind of uh, cleaned some things up, made things easier. You can see that in the previous slide, there's a bunch of, whoops, there's a bunch of stuff, like uh, dash dash SSH, dash dash standard out. Like, I want to see the standard out. Some people don't, I do. Like, I want to see what failed, why it failed, I want to see what's going on, that kind of thing. All right. So we can abbreviate all that by in the dots uh, shakedown in your home directory by adding any of the dash dash flags. You can just put them in that file and they'll automatically be the default from then on out. So it reduces the command line to something much shorter, right? The one exception is the DCOS URL. Uh, that is not in this file, but if you have it on your local environment, it will automatically pick it up now. So just be aware of that. Uh, and then the next thing to note is that if you're on a project, and I'm going to show you Marathon in a second, if we're in a project, it will automatically discover tests. So if you say dot, it will look through all of this directory and all subdirectories until it finds all test 
star.py. If it's test star.py, it will find it and it will execute it. Okay? That's important to note. You could just run a specific suite. In this particular case, I'm saying I want to run just this file and whatever's in it. Now, it could have a lot of tests in it, but that's one suite. It's not running all the files that are in there. It's not discovering anything. Last, I can run actually a single test. So I could say this is the test file, this uh, network part.py, colon, colon. If you've done any Python in the past, you may have used PyTest before. PyTest naturally has colon, colon, and then the test in the test suite. We're just doing the same thing that Py, uh, PyTest has always done. So you can say colon, colon, and then you're going to run not this little test suite, but just this test inside of that. That's the only thing you're going to run. Now there's one last thing that's not up here that's useful, I think, to me anyways. And that is, you can have a file that is a test file that is not labeled test. Now, if it's labeled test, it will auto-discover and it will run as part of a suite like this right up here. Whoops. Got to stop that. Okay, it will run, uh, if, if a file is called test underscore star dot pi, it will be discovered. But I happen to have some things that I like to run occasionally through Shakedown that I don't want auto-discovered. And the one that comes to mind that I'm happy to show you if you're interested is uh, over-provisioning. I don't tend to over-provision things, but sometimes I want to. So my default installation on Amazon for me is an m3.x.large, which essentially is a four-core machine. Okay? Sometimes, for certain tests, I'm not testing the nodes itself. I'm testing how Marathon is working. So I will tell each one of the nodes, and I'll show you some code. I'll cycle through all the private nodes, and I will essentially adjust and tell it that it doesn't have four cores, it actually has 100 cores. Right? And so it gives me a cluster that's large. And sometimes it's exactly what I'm looking for. But it's not something that I, I want to choose when that happens. Essentially, that's what I'm saying. So I have a file that's not, it, it's not, it doesn't have the nomenclature of test as part of the file name. But if I tell it through this, test system, uh, uh, Overprovision.py, it will actually run it. Right. I find it useful. And then inside of a Py test, it would look like this. Uh, and this is actually one of my examples uh, of NSAC. We actually run this. So I have a def, I've defined a function. It's uh, inside anything that's a function that has test as a prefix is a test. Anything else is intended to be supportive in nature. It doesn't have, it's not run unless some test executes it. <clears throat> There's a couple of exceptions to that, but we're going to see them in a second. Test UI available. I'm, I'm checking here with just an HTTP GET. Now, there's a couple of other things in particular with DCUS that we've added in, I don't know, maybe nine months ago. You can't just talk to the admin router. You have to be authorized to talk to the admin router. So there's a little token that gets passed around. So if you were to do an HTTP at the command line, or do like a curl request at the command line, you'll get a, like a 503 or 501, you'll get some kind of redirection error, or an unauthorized error, or something like this, right? So the important part here is what I'm doing on HTTP dot get here. This is in the Python module of DCOS. I have HTTP. It will automatically send that for you. So it's awesome. Right, it's really awesome. I do all kinds of tests now just with either Shakedown or Python alone uh, using those libraries because it's frustrating. It can be frustrating. Yeah, I'll show you what I mean if you're interested. Here we're just doing a simple request to make sure that the DCOS UR, uh, service URL, the Marathon user, that is the default service name of Marathon being installed on top of Marathon. We commonly, internally the company, we call it MOM now. Marathon on Marathon, M-O-M, so MOM. Right? It, sadly, there's a place in my code where I kill mom, and I'm sorry. Right? <laughs> but we wanted to see what happens when mom comes back. So, uh, terrible, terrible. Uh, and we're assuming that we give it 200. So if we get a 200 back, then then we successfully got an OK, an HTTP OK, and things are there. If not, it's not. And so that's the thing we're looking for. 
Oh, typically, if you're inside of that file, once again, if we're looking at, uh, uh, I'm sorry, if we're looking at that as a test, what you normally would have at the beginning of the test, at least, are these two things. You're going to import everything from Shakedown, you're going to import things from DCUF. Now, you don't have to. You certainly have to for Shakedown. There's a bunch of Shakedown things you're going to want. It'd be a question whether you want to use DCOS or not. Um, I'll show you a little bit more details as we get to the demo. A couple of functions. I mentioned there's some functions that are, uh, that, that if a function is labeled or starts with the word test, it will automatically run. And everything else is just like supportive. There's a couple of exceptions that are listed here. The first is the setup module. So if we do a setup module, we want to think setup test class. Uh, essentially, it's the test suite. This is the thing that will be run for everything that is inside that test file. Right? So it's called once for that test file. We have setup function. Oddly, the person who first created Shakedown, Scott, who's awesome, by the way, uh, and, and quite good at what he does, but I, I found it funny. I needed this, and he did. He was shocked that it worked. It works. <laughs> so, uh, there is a def setup function, and you literally pass in function as, as the parameter. Uh, that will be called as a setup for every test. That is something I might do using Marathon, where I make sure that no other applications are currently being deployed before I start the next test or something along those lines. Right. And then lastly, we have the teardown module. It is the reciprocal of this. Uh, it will be called once, and it's whenever that file is done running. It is, uh, I, I have started doing some scale tests. I'm not happy about the, how I'm doing it quite yet, but I'm happy to share what I'm doing. Uh, I'll, I'm running some scale tests. My preference is to give scale or performance numbers out to a, a, an external source, like we're thinking about going to Datadog. Right now, it just prints out a comma delimited set of numbers, which I commonly will paste into a spreadsheet. All right, that's what I'm doing now. The output of that comes out of this, out of a teardown module. It's when the entire test is completely done and we just want numbers at this point. All right. uh, and there's the helpful stuff. If, now, when you're getting started with Shakedown, the hardest part is, like, what are all the resources I need to know enough to get started? Now, I've already given you a lot. Install it, right? You're going to have to go Python, you're going to install it. Secondly, uh, and there's some Python tricks I'm going to show you that are useful. In particular, the context manager. I have to really like it. And now realize I'm new to Python. So you guys, there's probably people in here that know Python much better than I do. Come teach me. I'm happy to learn, right? But the context manager is great. I'm going to show you an example of that with Marathon on Marathon. Go to the API page. We keep up to date the API page. Whenever we make a sh shakedown function, we'll add it to that. Uh, we've been pretty good about maintaining that documentation. So far, it's manageable. Uh, and it's not too much. We'll take a look at that in a second. Now, oddly, uh, for me as a user, whenever you bring down shakedown, you also get the DCOS CLI. Now, I've started using the CLI internal Python code. So the, the CLI, the DCOS CLI, is written in Python as well. So I'm, I'm using the modules that the CLI uses inside of my shakedown, and I'll show you some examples of that. It is why I said from uh, DCOS import star, or reverse that, right? Import star from DCOS. The reason why is because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually use Marathon directly from DCOS. It's super helpful to me. So uh, if you are wondering what are the things that the Marathon module can do in Python, the code for that, unfortunately, it's not documented, right? You actually have to look at code. But it's, it's super easy when you look at the code. Just go to the DCOS CLI, and it's an open source project, so you'll be able to find these. All right? The last thing, so if you put together all these things, you should have enough information. I realize uh, you probably want an example. I'm going to show you some. I'm going to tell you where to go, in fact, for several examples. Uh, but outside of that, you might go outside of those examples. Those resources are what you're wanting to know. There's one more additional thing that's useful. Oftentimes, where you're getting back from a call, from a function call, is a JSON object. But you may not know, like, what's that structure? What does it look like? What are the things that are inside of it? Once again, very little documentation on that. 
My favorite place to go to is to go to Mesos or go to Marathon and get the JSON directly from it. Uh, it is a good source of documentation. I will show you that. Okay. Um, also, I've sometimes you just print out that JSON and go, okay, that's the thing it is. Now here's the thing I'm looking for. That's that's the way to get past that. If you this page will be all the resources that you would need to know to do a lot of work. This one page. So this is the resources. Outside of seeing an example. If we look at Shakedown and what it does today, uh, one, packaging. So I, I mentioned uh, Universe before. The thing that controls the Universe is something called Cosmos inside of DCOS. Those two things work together. You don't have to know much about it. All you need to do is call some Python libraries and it's super simple. An example, install package. And there's another method called install package and wait. Waiting is waiting until the package is fully installed. So you're actually just, now remember, this is why I, I emphasize so much that everything's asynchronous. I just recently, personally, I personally have written so much wait code recent, uh, over working on Marathon over the last few months that I recently put in all of the wait for events in Shakedown. So that, that was just pushed two weeks ago or a week ago. But there's always something you're waiting for. So uh, you'll start to see some code cleanup and some consolidation around that, I believe. Um, we'll do some command and file copies. You'll need SSH to do that. Uh, waiting for events. What are the th things you'll wait for? I'm waiting for a deployment. I'm waiting for a service endpoint to materialize. I'm waiting for a DNS to actually come into existence. I'm waiting for a DNS name to go away. I'm waiting for a service endpoint to go away. Like, I'm waiting for a task to be launched. Those are the kinds of things that I might be looking to wait for. And once I have waited for that, now I'm checking to see if something is the way I thought it should be. Right? Or I might go kill it. If I kill it, I kill a process. So you can see the combination of things, right? I'm going to launch something, maybe Marathon on Marathon. I'm going to launch an application on Marathon on Mar uh, Marathon. I'm going to wait for the task to materialize. When the, when the task is there, I'm going to execute a kill command on the process. I'm then going to see that, uh, that the task died and that uh, it was relaunched and relaunched with the same constraints that were there before. Maybe I had a constraint to the host. Maybe I, had a, maybe I didn't have a constraint at all. I may just verify that the task ID changed. All right. Those are useful things to know. By the way, if you're a framework author, this is the place to be, in my opinion. <laughs> Um, if you're a framework author, never reuse your task ID. It's a, it's a common thing that I see that, that, that it's, there's some problems that come with it. I can go into details, but not, not right now. Uh, fault injections, killing processes, restarting. This would be like kill the agent, um, kill the master. Um, by the way, a master recovery takes a very long time. It's, it's, it can be frustrating, so you want to be aware of that. But uh, sometimes it's useful to know like what's going to happen. We recently had a bug in Marathon within the last three or four months where we had task loss. We had a, we had a customer, this is very important to us, a very large customer, and they had some real challenges in their data center where they have network partitioning all the time, which is it's confusing to me, but they have it all the time. And so they would have these task loss. And so we fixed that in Marathon, but we wanted a shakedown test to confirm that it works the way we expected it to work. So that's, that's what we spent some time doing. And lastly, I just added these in as well, some firewall rules, where we can actually adjust the firewall rules uh, of a given node. Now, adjusting the firewall rules, you can't actually break a network, right? So we do that virtually. I literally go in there and stop ports. So I'm like, when I say that I'm gonna kill my connection to Zookeeper, literally I go change the firewall rules so that uh, 2081 is not accessible. Boom, no Zookeeper. <laughs> Now this is the reason, by the way, there is something that I refer to now as root marathon. That's the marathon on DCOS. And I had mom, marathon on marathon. One of the reasons I will create a mom environment is because when I kill the zookeeper, mom will always land on an agent. It's not on the master. It's really, really hard to control the master, like the root connection on a local host environment. So you want to be aware of those things. I also will commonly, like the things that you'll see in Shakedown, the ability to pull the IP address that mom landed on and go through all the other agents and find an IP address that mom's not on so that I can constrain a test that mom launches 
such that it won't land on the same node, right? So these are the kind of things that I would tend to do in code. I can see that I've gone somewhat long, so we'll be somewhat brief on code, but I actually want to look at code, right? So um, if you want to hide a file, I mentioned this, just don't name it test under bar. So here we have a non-discoverable pi test, and it only runs when you're explicit. So I'm going through a few tips and tricks here. Uh, working with Marathon, uh, I mentioned before, I, I actually use the DCOS Python module. So marathon.createClient, I say add an app. This is a JSON right here that I pulled. You can see that I sucked it right off a file. Uh, sometimes I'll create JSON right in Python. It varies on the size. Sometimes the JSON can be so long that I, it looks terrible in Python, and so I'd rather have it in a JSON file. So it varies. Uh, here, you can see here, I've, I've pulled an app from, uh, I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm just verifying that the, the user is none. So I'm asserting that there's no user defined on that, on that application. Uh, and then I run it, and notice here I'm doing a kill. So that's a long-winded way of killing. We've actually made some, some improvements there. I mentioned that it's useful to use the context manager, especially if you're in a mom situation. So here, in code, I'm just checking, checking to see that this will run with a good user. In other words, a user that's defined in the network. So I have a good user test and a bad user test. What happens if an app has a user that it's supposed to run with and that user doesn't even exist in the cluster? Well, bad things happen, right? So I have both tests. Here I say with Marathon on Marathon. So for the context of everything in this code from here to here, everything that's uh, within this uh, indented code will be a creation of Marathon right here, this client, is on mom, not on the root one. If this code here was here, it would be on root. But since it's inside of this context, it will be on mom. So those are the kind of things that I would do, is I'd have a marathon on marathon, and then I would uh, be within the context of it. Now all work in here is being worked on the marathon on marathon in my uh, I mentioned some of the things you might be waiting for, DNS, tasks, service endpoints. Uh, if you wanted to create your own wait point, uh, the spinner that I created is fairly abstract. All you need to do is create a predicate. So when we're creating a predicate, here you can see a task CPU predicate. All we're checking to verify is uh, some, some code here is the predicate, and here's me using it. I, I pass in a lambda, and the whole point of this is I don't want this function to call right here. I want it to call only within the context of this function. So this is somewhat on the advanced side, where I'm actually passing in functions into a function to be executed within the function. Hence the lambda, right? Uh, so just be aware of that. Some of these can be somewhat complex. But again, uh, there's already, most of the things you want to do probably are already in place there. If you're going to use, if you're going to create your own context, this is how Marathon on Marathon looks. We create the context lib. You can see it up here. Uh, all we're doing is a bunch of work, and then we yield. It's the finally that recovers the TOML file that's being used. So that's a fairly simple example. Uh, and then this is us using it. So you already saw an example of this two slides ago of using Marathon on Marathon. All right, so I am going to, what do I have? I've got like five minutes maybe? Tell me I have five. Three. I have three minutes. Stare at the screen for a second. <laughs> uh, Marathon, you're going to see this code in the test directory. Here we're checking the default user, and all this is is a confirmation that the user that is being launched is the root user and nothing else. So in this particular case, it's a little bit tricky where I'm sending an error code of one if it's not root. So it's a lot of <coughs> magic there at the bottom, uh, but not a big deal. If we actually wanted to run that, we literally would say shake down, run this, and you can see the test root marathon, and this would run a couple things that are useful. It will tell you what the version of the cluster that you're on. It will tell you the version of PyTest you're running on. Uh, and then I commonly will output, in fact, if we ran, Let's show the abbreviated version. There's shakedown, test, system, test, uh, basic, maybe. Uh, in this particular example, on setup, I actually, because I'm on a marathon, on marathon environment, I actually print out the version of marathon because I don't always know what's in the universe. Uh, and I want to make sure that what I'm testing is the exact version. So we are pretty much out of time. I was going to give a little bit more demoing. Um, if you want to just meet me at the booth, um, I'm at the Mesa Secure booth, I'll, I'll go straight out there from here. And uh, I can dive into some more details if you want. I will end by saying thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys.
don't want to take up too much time for those coming here, but if you have more questions, please join me. Thanks.